Okay, so welcome everybody to this colloquium today. Um, just do... uh, so we have a pleasure today to uh, listen to a colloquium from Professor Edwin Bergen. He made his PhD in 1995 with a study on the chemical and physical structure of giant molecular clouds. So this is actually where protoplanetary disks come from at the University of Massachusetts, which is at the East Coast. And then he went on for eight years to go to Harvard, which is also in the area in Boston, uh, before he moved to Michigan, which is a little bit further north in, in uh, yeah, around Detroit. Since 2003, as first as an associate professor, and then he became a full professor. And since 2015, he's the chair of the astronomy department there. And when it comes to protoplanetary disks, uh, he's a very big caliber, I would say. So it's about as big as it gets. Uh, so he has more than 700 publications, uh, 400 refereed papers. He was involved in many space missions in the science teams like Spitzer, Herschel, Alma, et cetera. Um, recently, he, he will, he's also involved in yeah, protostars and planets conference. He was already before, but he, he is also co eyeing a, a chapter in this prestigious conference that will come up next year about chemical habitability. So he's moving also towards exoplanets and habitability. Um, he received numerous prizes and, and awards among them, and I found this very notable. Is, in his in honor for his long lasting efforts to improve diversity and inclusion at universities. Um, yeah, so I met Ted in, in several conferences. I think we share uh, similar ideas, similar uh, ideas about chemical and physical processes and how to model them. Um, but the devil is in the details. So even if you assume slightly different maybe a small thing, results can be quite different. And that's why we don't always agree, but I think in generally we, we do agree. <laughs> so we, we never really managed to make a detailed comparison, but today, you know, we will enjoy his talk. Um, so I would say when, you know, when you are in the US and you need to model for protoplanetary disk, go to TED. If you are in Europe, you go to Leiden or you come to us. But let's, let's enjoy his talk today. Thanks a lot, Peter. That was that was very generous. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about some work that is uh, it's relatively relatively new, and I'm going to just do a data dump of the some of the latest things that are happening, particularly uh, with Alma, uh, but uh, where I think we are beginning to understand the chemistry of planetary forming disks or planet forming disks. And uh, as if time allows, I'll talk a little bit uh, and look forward to uh, James Webb. I want to acknowledge uh, that the work I'll be showing, um, I'll just call out the, the students and postdocs. So uh, my student here, uh, Jenny Callahan, and my postdoc, Arthur Bosman, that, that's the primary work that I'll show you here. But I'm also uh, relying on work done by John Illay uh, at Leeds and Charles Law at Harvard. Um, this, of course, is is what we, what we're you know the revolution today you know of all the exoplanets that we are detecting, and we want to understand how, essentially how these things form, and that's that's writ large. But you know ultimately, you know for me, I want to understand how they form with the stuff uh, that life needs. But that's sort of a long term. A goal. The easier thing to approach right now is, the, is of course, the giant planets and the atmospheres of the giant planets. And so this was from uh, um, Matt Husudin's review. This is the, the water mixing ratio, which is a proxy for metallicity uh, in planetary atmospheres. These are all gas giants. And the, the dark blue is where the, the, the oxygen is supersolar, and the light blue is where they're subsolar and you can see the large error bars James Webb will will lower those error bars but in general most planets not all 
are generally substellar and it's again not uniform. And it, it, how is that set? And that would be consistent with the birth of these planets beyond the water ice line because the water ice would be in the core uh, and the planet would accrete essentially oxygen depleted gas. Uh, but what are the processes involved and, and how can we tease out uh, planet formation from this? And that's sort of a general goal. The tools that we'll kind of use to do this, uh, in this case, are resolved observations from ALMA of both the, the dust and what you're looking at here. And I'll show you pictures of these throughout. Uh, this is the, the thermal continuum emission from dust grains about a millimeter in size. So the dust has grown from the sizes of the interstellar medium. Uh, and we think it's grown even beyond that because the interpretation of these gaps you see in the dust emission is that there are hidden planets uh, that we infer to be present. We can also observe the molecules and, and one of the key molecules is carbon monoxide and its isotopologs. But I will show you tons uh, more uh, different molecules to try and tease out what uh, chemistry is actually happening during the phase where uh, the early phases of, of planetary assembly. Uh, so of course the dust represent the seeds of the terrestrial worlds and the cores of the giant planets and the gas is what's accreted by the envelopes. And if we can study the composition of the gas, what, uh, what is missing is, is essentially the composition of the solids that gets fed to terrestrial planets. So I'm gonna look a little bit about what's in the gas. I'm gonna focus on you know, the main carriers, but I'm really gonna uh, eventually explore the chemistry uh, in greater detail. So when Alma came along, one of the first things that were done is, is people did surveys of the gas emission uh, that Alma essentially allowed us to get the sensitivity uh, to the gas and of course resolve the, the dust. And this is one of the first one uh, from uh, Megan Ansdell. There, there have since been several of these. Uh, and when you, what the idea was that, you know, you can use CO, it's a traditional tracer of the H2 mass. And so I, we can now study the mass of, pro, of the gas in protoplanetary disks. Our other trace of the mass is the dust. Uh, and we calibrate uh, that, that dust to gas mass ratio, right? So when they did this, and uh, this is from Adam Miatello's work, this is the disk gas mass as measured from, from 12, or well, in this case, 13 CO. They found a surprising result that the, the CO inferred H2 mass in, in many systems was below the mass of a Jupiter. That is by a million or 2 million years, all of these disks either have lost all their mass and they must have made their giant planets already. Uh, or our assumption that we know the CO abundance is incorrect. That is my calibration from CO mass to H2 mass is wrong, okay? Uh, when I look at the dust, you find that the masses that you would infer from the dust are closer to this line here. This is what's called the minimum mass solar nebula, the minimum amount of mass that is required to make a, a, a solar system such as our own. So something's going on here. And uh, a lot of people looked at this and, and in my group, and this is uh, work from Coco Zhang, this is the a measured measurement of the, what we estimate is the CO abundance. So this is CO over H2 versus time. So these are those surveys. And if we interpret what's going on is not that the mass, the H2 mass is going away, but rather something's happening to the CO, this is the CO abundances. And so this is what's in the interstellar medium, our calibration. And we're off by about an order of magnitude. And the neat thing is that when we looked at younger systems and where we isolated the, the, the gas in the disk, the CO gas in, in the young, youngest disks, we see almost normal abundances. And in about a million years, something happens and the CO abundance appears to change. So what, what's going on there? Uh, and the similar result uh, was independently found by Jenny Bergner uh, at the same time. There is another way to get at mass and that's through hydrogen deuteride. Uh, and those masses generally agree uh, with that of the dust suggesting that there is uh, a CO abundance problem. 
So I'm gonna show you some results from a, a, an Amalarge program. It's called Molecules at Planning for Me Scales. Uh, it was led by Karen Oberg, Viviana Guzman, uh, Catherine Walsh, Yuri Akawa, and, and myself, where we observed five protoplanetary disks at very high uh, angular resolution, 0.3 arc seconds at three millimeter and 0.15 arc seconds at uh, basically 1.3 millimeters. And we observed 40 lines for 20 species, so a big chemistry survey. And these are the disks that we targeted. These are all very well studied disks. And you know, it's kind of neat how you could see the orientations and Giamarigi. You can actually see the flaring and the dust emission is what you're looking at here. And so these, this is the results uh, from the survey. Uh, different disks are going in this direction. So let's see, this is what, uh, that one's definitely Giamarigi. This is AS209, that's HD163. So this must be IM loop. And this one over here is MWC480. And uh, so I'm just gonna let this move and you'll see all of the different molecular emission lines and the different morphologies uh, that are observed both within disks uh, and across disks. So obviously there's, <laughs> there's interesting things happening for us to try and, and tease out. And this is just, you know, my God, we probably can work on this data set for, you know, a decade or, or more. This is one sample of the results. So again, looking at CO, uh, so there's the, the dust continuum images, and this is C18O. Uh, the most optically thin tracer of the, the CO column, which again is a potential proxy for H2. And if I compare the dust column density, that's what's shown here by Coco Zhang to the CO column density. So the dark is what we see in the dust and the light blue is what we see in CO, okay, across these three districts. Both of these things are supposed to trace H2, right? But yet they so completely different structures. And which one of these is telling us the, the quote unquote truth? And the answer probably is they, they both aren't. Uh, but we're pretty certain that there's something certainly going on uh, with CO. So where could it be? What's going on? Could it be that I'm removing the carbon from CO and sticking it somewhere else? We've looked for it in the gas, we didn't find it. Okay, so it's likely if something's happening, you, for example, could take CO. CO is emitting from gas that's above 20 degrees Kelvin. That's the sublimation temperature of CO. So if the gas temperature or dust temperature falls below that value, the CO would freeze out. What we're seeing is that the CO abundance in gas that's greater than 20 Kelvin is evolving. And how could that be? Well, if I transfer my CO into CO2, for example, by a chemistry, the CO2 would freeze out. It has a higher sublimation temperature and I wouldn't see the CO where I expect it to be. So that's one possibility. You could put the CO in CO2 or methanol. Uh, another possibility, and, the, and these two things could be linked, is if the CO could be linked to the dust evolution, and I'll show you that. And there's a very recent paper by Maxime Rod, who they suggest that, well, we all are wrong, and it's because we're not modeling the disks with hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, that actually, we, we've looked at this, and, and we're fairly certain that that is not the case, and I can get into that if uh, somebody wants to. But I think the MAPS data that I just showed you of the resolved disks shows you that there's something going on. So what we think is actually happening is two things. There might be chemistry, but the CO is definitely being caught up in the grain evolution. That is, if you have some mixing from the CO and the surface layers, it could get mixed down and get caught up in what the dust is doing. And the dust is a moving target in disk systems. It settles to the midplane. It basically grows and settles through gravitational settling to what becomes a dust rich midplane. And it can also drift radially inwards. And the volatiles essentially get concentrated basically essentially where we're seeing those millimeter dust grain emitting. But that's probably where all the volatiles are, the water, the CO, probably in the form of something like CO2. 
So Sebastian Kreit has modeled this where he basically takes the, the grains and evolves them growing and settling and includes uh, a very rudimentary, uh, essentially linkage between the gas and the dust. So I'm gonna let this evolve. And what you'll see is that the dust starts out small and essentially grows and settles, all right? The CO abundance, you can see this is the CO call the space density and something's happening to it. This is the, the normalization. So what you're observing is in the outer parts of the disk, the CO is getting mixed down and getting captured by this evolving dust and carried to the midplane, which is emitting the layers where the CO is emitting, or it's depleting the layers where CO is emitting in disk systems. So essentially the dust evolution is grabbing more volatiles than we naively thought it would. And so there's more CO in comets, more CO2 in comets and, and so on and so forth. Now, what about going beyond CO? So this is one disk, this is AS209. And I'm gonna do, these are radial emission cuts. So what we did is we azimuthally averaged the emission from a, the molecules and you're looking at essentially a radial distribution. And this is the CATNO in this system, which as I showed you before, isn't what the dust is doing, but let's just say that, okay, this is what CO is doing. This is a, a very simple hydrocarbon, C2H. It appears to be anti-correlated with CO, where CO is showing some sort of dip in its emission, C2H is rising, okay. This is formaldehyde, H2CO, doing something else. I mean, it's really amazing. And going down to this plot, this is HCN, a very commonly observed molecule. It also isn't doing what CO is doing, where CO is showing dips, it's peaking, but it's peaking in a different place than C2H did. And the very more very complex molecules by uh, disk standards, this is methyl cyanide CH3CN. That's only peaking in the inner, in this case, this would be about 40 AU or 50 AU. And you look at this and it's, you know, I, I was like, wow, <laughs> nothing makes sense. What's going on here, right? Everything is doing something different. But I actually think there's, there's something that this data will, is telling us as to what is going on. And there are clues and I'm gonna try and work through them. One is this general picture that the CO, like the dust, is some sort of moving target. The dust evolving, the CO is evolving, and the chemistry is responding in kind. So I'm gonna focus first on the very simple molecules. So HCN, and in this case, C2H. Again, these, these are commonly observed molecules. In fact, C2H, is as bright as 13 CO in disk systems. It's, it's a signpost that something is going on and this is a very important molecule and why that is, we have to figure out. So one thing we can actually do in these disks with this resolution is we can actually resolve with our own eyes, the heights at which molecules are emitting, which if, if you'd have told me we'd be able to do this, before we started this business, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, and so what you're looking at is these, the, these are channel maps for a, a particular molecule is a CO, 13 CO and C18 O. And what you'll see is the, oh, you see, I'm supposed to give a talk. So here we are, you're seeing the front side of this disc and you also can see the back side. So what's going on, of course, CO is frozen out in the midplane of the disk. It won't emit where it's ice is. So you're gonna see you know, a front side and a back side. That, that's a guarantee, right? What we actually can do is you can see it within the AMA data. That is, you can resolve this front and back side and 13 CO is less flared than 12 CO because it's less optically thick. The 12 CO becomes optically thick higher up on the disk. And as you go to the lesser abundant isotopologs, you sort of getting deeper into the system. So that's really, really cool. And we can do this for some of the other molecules, not all of them. And HCN and C2H are one of the ones that we could do. So these are the measured emission heights 
shown as these sort of shade or colored filled uh, dots here. So this is what's a Z over R. So what you're looking at is height versus radius. So this is height normalized to radius of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. 12 CO is generally at 0.3 Z over R, 13 CO Z over R 0.2 and HCN and C2H are emitting closer to the midplane than I naively would have thought they were. I would have thought they were emitting higher up in the atmosphere. So that's information. Other information that we can gain from these data is we obtain multiple transitions. So we observe different rotational transitions and from these we can measure excitation temperatures. And since the densities are high in these systems, these excitation temperatures actually should be the gas kinetic temperature in the zone where the molecules are emitting. So what you're looking at here is the measured excitation temperature for HCN, shown as the sort of uh, kind of blue and with error bars, and the C2H uh, in purple with, uh, again, error bars. And I think the, the gray line is the, the excitation temperature of 12 CO, which is emitting higher up, right? I told you that. So it's actually coming from hotter gas. And the neat thing is you can see here that, you know, these things are generally coming from 20 to 40 K gas. In typical, if I look at HD163, right? Okay, so there is a separation between what C2H is doing and HCN is doing. So HDN is generally colder, 20 to 30 K, and C2H is sometimes warmer. But the, the amazing thing is looking here, I'm at 50 AU in this disk. HD163 is, is an A star. The, this, this is a warm disk, right? This thing has to be emitting from closer, the HCN has to be emitting from colder glass. Where is the cold gas? So the disk has a hot surface, and a colder midplane, HCN has to be coming from somewhere closer to the midplane as inferred from the emission heights. And C2H appears to, in some cases, be slightly higher. Other clues can come from the larger molecules. So this is HC3N, CH3CN, and C3H2. Let's not worry about you know, all the, the gobbledygook associated what as to what each molecule is. They're slightly more complex molecules. They're harder to make than the simple molecules. They have emission, but the emission is generally confined to the inner tens of AU. You're not seeing it all the way out at 100 AU, 200 AU, which you are for HCN and C2H. The bigger things are closer in. So, okay, more information. Methyl cyanide, CH3CN, is a well-known probe of temperature. This is what's called a symmetric top molecule. And if you make a rotation diagram, essentially, of its population versus its energy state, the energy of the given transitions that you observe, the, the line that you measure here is what's called the rotational temperature. That is a direct measure of the kinetic temperature of the gas because of the molecular astrophysics of this molecule. Uh, and so methyl cyanide is emitting in this one disk, HC163296. It's emitting at 40, uh, 45 AU, essentially. Uh, and it's coming from 35 Kelvin. All right, so this is a model of the temperatures of that disk. So in this case, in Z over R, this is from John LA uh, versus radius. And you can see the lines here of where the model says the temperature is. Again, the, the surface is hotter, the midplane is colder, all right? And of course, it's hotter close to star, colder further away. Methyl cyanide has to be coming from somewhere just above the midplane. So, okay, that's again, information. So how can we figure this out? So let's work it through. So this is a uh, work from Arthur Bosman. So what he did is he tried to simultaneously explain what's going on with CO, sort of, and also C2H. So what we did is we used CO, the CO column density, and the estimated missing CO is included in this because we assumed a mass for the system based on the dust. All right, and if somebody wants to argue with me, we can, that, that is a, an assumption that we make. So this is the CO depletion factor for the three disks that we looked at. 
Okay, so you see we're missing about an order of magnitude of CO in the, in the gas where the chemistry is happening, where we're essentially observing the disk. So we're modeling the chemistry in the areas where uh, we're observing the emission. And the, the orange here is the C2H column density estimated by Viviana Guzman. All right, and when you get to the inner disk, we were actually able to estimate upper limits for the C2H column density via uh, a particular technique. All right, so what we're trying to do is what we, we take is a, a, a thermochemical model of the system. So those of you who work with Peter's ProDemo, we are using one of the, the Leiden version in this case, it's called DALI, which again is a thermochemical model that includes the thermal physics, the chemistry, and predicts the emission. And we're gonna compare it to the data and try to understand what the chemistry is doing. And the things that we can vary in the system is, well, the mass is fixed. So we can marry, vary what's going on with the CO. Uh, and in this case, we vary the carbon to oxygen ratio and the amount of small dust in the system. That is the dust is grown. And one of the questions we don't know is the dust starts small, grows to large, how much small stuff is still left around? Has everything grown to large sizes? Or we know that some small dust is present uh, because of other observational constraints. And so, well, all right, what can the chemistry tell us about that? So these are different models for the system. In this, this case, MWC 480. This is the C2H column density, okay? This is if we have a sort of a stellar C over O ratio. If the C over ratio is one, where would the C over O ratio be unity? It's when the C over O, the C and the O are in CO. That is, it's CO is the main carrier of carbon, CO would be the main carrier of oxygen, all right? And the amazing thing is that the only way we can match the column density of C2H is if we have some free carbon that's not in CO in the system. And where is this coming from is an interesting question. Is it coming from PAWS, for example? Are you photoablating PAWS and freeing up carbon? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. And we're trying to figure that out. And James Webb, I think, will help. But this is what we see in all of these systems. To match C2H, we have to have a higher C over ratios. And we also have to deplete the dust uh, certainly out here at about 50 AU, and then maybe not have the same amount of dust depletion when we get uh, to the inner disk. Now C2H, remember, has slightly higher temperatures measured than say HCN and methyl cyanide. So it may be coming from the surface of the disk and the planets are born in the midplane. So one question might be, well, what's happening in the midplane, right? So I went backwards, let me go forwards. And I think that C2H is actually telling us what's going on in the midplane, right? The, the amazing thing about this molecule is it's detecting in young disks that are a million years old, two million years old. It's even seen in disks that are 10 million years old. C2H is a radical. What does that mean? That means it's highly reactive. This thing does not exist in the gas for very long. It has very short chemical lifetimes. The only way it could persist over 10 million years if it has to be a gas phase chemistry and it has to be an equilibrium gas phase chemistry. All right, and I'll talk about what the implications for that are in a minute. So this is a model from Arthur Bosman, a different paper, not related to MAPS, a whole bunch of different molecule models exploring what it would take to get C2H into an equilibrium chemistry. And you can see that we can actually achieve that. And what we found is if we take that chemistry for C2H, which is a high C over O ratio, depleting dust grains so that the gas is in photochemical equilibrium, that is, there's more UV than there should be. And you basically are unable to have UV come in and release molecules off the grains, break them apart, just dilutely. And it powers a gas phase chemistry that could exist for millions of years. And we were able to take this chemistry, and this is work still in progress, and match the emission from methyl cyanide. So this is 
methyl cyanide, the CH3CN, that complex molecule. And this is the exact same chemistry that Arthur used to match C2H, photochemical equilibrium. Uh, and the model here, the data is shown in the thick line, the model as the thin lines, obviously we're not matching things 100%, but we're able to, we're able to make it. And this is just gas phase chemistry, not doing anything else. And so that's really fascinating because if we, the chemistry that we're used to, that we started out with was honed for, for 30 years. And it was honed in dark clouds, such as this one. This is Barnard 68. You're seeing the C18 O emission in the, as the color scale and extinction contours uh, as the white contour. So this is a centrally concentrated object. It's a pre-stellar core. It's at 10 K. And the reason why the CO is not peaking where the H2 is peaking here, the, where the extinction peaks, that's where the H2 peaks, is because the CO is frosting out onto cold dust grains. The chemistry in this system would have a CO ratio of one because the water is ice and the CO is in the gas. The, the grains have not evolved substantially. It's driven by cosmic rays. And so this chemistry, again, we've been working on for 30 years, it makes CO, makes unsaturated hydrocarbons and nitriles. But on the grains, you make saturated molecules. That is chemistry on the surfaces of grains. You make water, you make methane, and all kinds of other complex saturated molecules. In that chemistry, the grains provide a sink because it's hard to bring things off the grains. Once they get on there at 10K, they kind of stay there. And the ultimate equilibrium is when everything is on the grain. But that doesn't happen because you make a star before you do that. And just to show you that when I say we make unsaturated carbon chains, this is a, uh, a survey of Barnard 68 with the IRAM 30 meter telescope where we see unsaturated hydrocarbons you know, and nitriles. And, and other things, okay? In this chemistry, in the disk, I think we're seeing what's called an end state chemistry or what we're calling it. We are inferring a elevated C over O ratio. The cosmic rays are not present because stellar winds impede the cosmic rays that are ionizing the chemistry in the interstellar medium to come in, but I still need some source of energy for my chemistry. And that energy is coming from UV photons and probably X-rays. In the, in, the in the disk, the grain mass is concentrated, all right? What that means is I have less small grains and so the UV is coming deeper in the disk. I'm not making CO anymore because the CO is gone. It's, it's lost into the mid plane. And the chemistry that I'm observing is basically one that's in photochemical equilibrium and you make things like nitriles and hydrocarbons. Why is that? Because the gas is by and large oxygen poor because water is gone and CO is also partially gone. And you have an H2 gas with carbon and nitrogen. And what are you gonna make? You're gonna make things with hydrogen, carbon and nitrogen. So that is the chemistry of a protoplanetary disk. So this is in photochemical equilibrium. It's essentially disconnected from what the dust is doing now. All the chemistry that we're observing is in a way like the dregs, which is kind of depressing. But what it's telling you is that the evolution of the pebbles, where the volatiles are, that was fixed at an earlier stage. And why does that matter? It's because that's the stuff that makes terrestrial worlds. And so if I want to understand terrestrial worlds and the chemistry of the stuff that goes on those pebbles, those millimeter sized dust grains, I got to go to earlier phases. That's information for astronomers. And we speculated that maybe this is related to that one million year old time, one million year old or one million year time scale where something is happening to CO. Another neat thing is by depleting the small dust, the UV is penetrating deeper into the disk and that can actually potentially allow for active accretion in these systems via something called the magnetorotational instability. That's an implication of this work. So I'm gonna shift gears now. And that, that's 
Ted's omnibus of what he thinks Alma is telling us about the chemistry of protoplanetary disks, and I hope it made sense. Uh, and I'll be happy to take questions after this next section where I'm gonna move and talk about the inner disk. And why are we interested in this is because we have this amazing space telescope that to all intents and purposes is going to be working flawlessly soon, which is just amazing. So of course that's the, the James Webb Space Telescope. But prior to James Webb, we had the Spitzer Space Observatory that observed the same mid-infrared wavelengths that James Webb will be probing. And James Webb will be observing similar disk systems as was done with Spitzer. And here's just a sample of the Spitzer specter towards a bunch of different objects. And Titari stars that are young, basically solar mass or below solar mass stars are ones where we often see water vapor emission dominating the spectrum. You also think, see things like CO2, well, I can go back. Here's a model of what James Webb's going to see. You have water, you have OH, CO2, HCN, C2H2. We hope to see methane, things like that. But Spitzer pr provides a sort of a legacy. And the, the water to CO ratio is measured to be of order unity uh, in this gas. And uh, Peter has been doing a tons of work on this. And you know, Prodemo has been applied to this uh, probably more times than I can count. Uh, and this is just an example of this. So this is the, the spectrum of TW Hydra and, and a model from his fairly recent paper. And to match this spectrum, you essentially have to have what's called a high dust to gas mass ratio. What does that mean? That means the dust has evolved. And I, I hope I've motivated that uh, right now. And there's another alternative that uh, perhaps there's a, a planet there that's carved a cavity, but let's not worry about that. Uh, and this plot here is again, uh, height over radius versus radius from model results, just essentially showing you the, the emission or the distribution of different molecules and the red shows where the various emission lines will be originating. And so the, the neat thing about Spitzer and James Webb, so AMA we're probing the chemistry pretty much from the closest we've gotten so far is about 5 AU, and that was really hard. We're really mostly doing it at about 10 AU and beyond. Uh, with James Webb, we're gonna be inside 10 AU. We're gonna basically be at 1 AU and observing the chemistry just on top of the region where uh, terrestrial planet material is essentially beginning to be assembled. And if I can model the gas and understand the gas composition, I can ask, perhaps what's missing, and that's what's in the solids, and we'll go to terrestrial worlds. And the thing I want to talk about is uh, something that uh, Tom Bethel and I did a long time ago, where we show that in regions where it gets above 400 K, water can form very quickly via gas phase reactions, and it actually can form so quickly that the formation rate can just exceed the destruction rate from photo dissociation. And when that happens, water self-shields itself. It protects water molecules downstream from radiation, but it also can protect other molecules from the destructive effects of UV. Uh, and why is that? That is because it's not sublimation temperature. I'm sorry, this is uh, photo dissociation cross-section versus wavelength. So you can see the water photo dissociation cross-section here is continuous across the UV wavelengths where the molecules are essentially dissociated. Now, self-shielding is something that's been known for a long time. H2 and CO are what can also protect themselves uh, against destructive effects of UV radiation. That's because they are dissociated by a line process. And you can see here the, the lines for for CO. And well, emission lines or absorption lines can become optically thick quite readily, right? They're in discrete regions of the wavelength spectrum. You can absorb essentially to an optical depth of unity. And then CO molecules are protected downstream from photodissociation from wavelengths of CO of uh, UV at that point. But water, if water can self shield, it can protect anything below it. It's like a cap, sort of like what the ozone layer does for the earth. And so 
the UV opacity in a typical disk system is dust plus molecular, normally we could ignore the molecular part, but the dust might be depleted, right? There's more UV penetration, and under that circumstance, maybe the UV is dominated by water. And if you look at the column densities they infer for water, it's this is the number, a typical number, and I multiply it by the photoabsorption cross section that you see here. You can observe that the optical depth in the UV from water absorption is greater than unity. So we wanted to reanalyze Arthur Bosman, Jenny Callahan, and myself what Spitzer is telling us uh, from the basis of uh, models where we put in water self-shielding and UV shielding. Again, this is using the DALI model. So this is a model where we have a high gas to dust ratio, again, Z over R versus radius. And you're looking at the water abundance, okay? So for a model without water self-shielding, a model with water self-shielding, the red here is where the, the emission lines that James Webb and Spitzer uh, would observe. And this is the line at which the basically 17 micron dust is optically thick. So what does that mean? That means we can only observe above that line, but it doesn't matter because the, the lines are become optically thick way up here in the upper atmosphere. But okay, you can see when we include water self-shielding, the water vapor distribution changes somewhat. So what does this mean? So here's a plot from Arthur. This is temperature versus H2O column density, sort of the buildup of column density as I go from the surface going down, only this time, instead of plotting it versus radius or height in that case, I'm plotting it versus temperature. So colder means you're closer to the midplane, hotter means you're closer to the surface. And if I don't include water self-shielding, this is the structure, the, the distribution I get. If I do include water self-shielding and the extra heating that is provided by dissociating water molecules up higher at higher layers, right? When you dissociate a molecule, it comes off with extra energy. That energy can be transferred to the gas. If I include that heating, you see that there becomes, the disk becomes hotter up here and gets a little bit colder and then a little bit higher, hotter. This is what is the typical column density and temperature that is inferred from the observations. What we found when we analyzed that is that there's two regimes. There's this hot gas, that because of the excitation conditions of the lines that are emitting uh, at the mid-infrared, which have basically 1,000 K or 2,000 K upper state energies, they emit only from this material. When the Spitzer lines and the web lines of water vapor, water 16, will only be emitting from about 1% and tracing 1% of the water column. Uh, and you might be able to observe lesser abundant isotopal logs and get a little bit deeper, but to truly trace the column, we have to go to the far infrared. Uh, most of the column is colder, all right? And this is a paper that Arthur just submitted. And just to show you that we are matching observations, uh, let's see, the orange here is the Spitzer spectrum of a typical disk, and the blue is our model. This is the base Dali model, and you can see that we're not matching observations and we come better an improvement when we include uh, the water self-shielding. Now, the neat thing is when we go for molecules beyond water. So this is looking at the abundance distribution of CO2. Same plot, abundance versus height and radius, model without self-shielding, model with self-shielding. The red is where the lines are emitting from. And this is the optical surface. So you can only see above that surface. The neat thing is, is when you include water self-shielding, you essentially kill CO2 and its abundance in the, the area where lines are emitting. Uh, the CO4 formation, CO2 formation actually gets suppressed. Uh, it's because the disk is warmer and the OH is going into water. But, you know, I think only Peter and I really care about the, the actual mechanics of the chemistry. So this is uh, trying to compare these models to observations. So this is essentially what's observed. So the black is water and the red is CO2. 
This is our standard model without water self-shielding. And you can see that our CO2 lines are way too bright relative to what's going on with water. When we include our standard model where we have shielding and the heating, we actually could do much better, but we're still not there. And we were trying to figure out, you know, what could be going on because there's not as many levers to pull in terms of the chemistry uh, in this region. And what we think might be happening is that the CO2 abundance might get truncated beyond the water snow line. And, and how could that be? And there's, some, there's something called the cold finger effect. And the cold finger effect is what I was telling you, that these volatiles on the surface can get mixed up with the grain evolution. And Sebastian Kreit also looked at this for water. So this is a, a model of du evolving dust grains and their water content. So the bluer ones have more water, the red have less water. Let me go back. And we're gonna let this, these things evolve with time and grow, all right? For a particular list, this is just outside the water snow line, all right? And this is the, the vapor pressure of water, and this is essentially the, the atmospheric abundance, if you will, of water vapor. And if I don't have grain evolution, essentially not much happens to the water distribution or anything, all right? But if I include grain evolution, the grains grow, so this is versus size. So they're growing to larger sizes. This is versus height. They sink to the mid plane. And the other thing that happens is that you start stealing water from the upper levels of the disk and sticking it in the mid plane here. All right. That can actually steal OH and suppress the formation of CO2 beyond the water snow line. And if I do that, I basically remove CO2 from here. And now I can match essentially the observed spectrum of water vapor and CO2 at the same time. So that's kind of neat. And we also were able to have a little bit of fun uh, with water 18, but I, I think I, I've probably gone into so much complexity here that I want to take a step back and just sort of summarize what is going on. So I've been trying to talk to you about the chemistry of planet formation. And what I think, so sorry, this, this is sort of like the TED bubble. All right, this is what I think is going on in protoplanetary disks. And in the system, the CO abundance like the dust size distribution is an evolving quantity. We know this from observational constraints and also from detailed models such as what I showed you by Sebastian Kreit. The observed disk chemistry is essentially when you get beyond a million years, it's in a UV dominated photochemical equilibrium. All right, that is it's, what's happening is the, the, the grains are becoming decoupled from the gas. All right, and what that means is that the chemistry of the solids is essentially fixed when we get to observe it at a few million years. And any changes that happen that may matter for terrestrial worlds happen at earlier stages. Gas giants beyond 10 AU are born in gas with a high C to O ratio. How do I know that? Because I am now inferring the chemistry of the gas closer to the midplane where the planets are being born. And we are inferring a high C over O ratio to match that chemistry and a substellar over H and likely a subcellar C over H. And that's how planets are born. What happens to them as they evolve? Maybe there's mixing in the giant planets between their cores and their atmospheres. Maybe they swallow tons of pebbles or planetesimals or whatever. I don't know, but observationally, that's what we see. When we get to the inner disk, we can reveal the hidden volatiles things get evaporated. We start tracing the composition of these ice-coated pebbles. That's where James Webb is gonna come into play. But I think water self-shielding and water UV shielding is a key to that chemistry. And I didn't get into this. It may actually give us an answer for oxygen anomalies in, the, in meteorites. But going forward, we have Webb outer disk, inner disk, Alma outer disk. Can we connect the two, right? Can we see what is evolutionary here? And what other constraints can we set on planets? And it's an insanely exciting time 
it, it's like a little sandbox. Uh, and I will stop there. And thank you so much. Thank you for your exciting talk. It's always a bit embarrassing to hear the, the applause. Uh, just imagine you would sit now in a big uh, okay. colloquium room. Anyway, uh, so if you have any questions, then please uh, raise your hand. Okay, so we have a first question of uh, Stephen Moistures. It's a... Um, I, uh, a, a characteristically very dense talk uh, filled with lots of data, um, uh, especially very interesting ideas. I, I appreciated that. Um, you mentioned how to connect uh, the inner disk with the outer disk, and then you teased us a little bit about your idea that water uh, UV self-shielding uh, may provide a key to understanding the uh, dichotomy between the non-carbonaceous and the carbonaceous um, uh, populations in meteorites. You specifically mentioned oxygen. Um, I wonder if you could uh, take a minute and elaborate on that a little bit and tell us how that, how that helps us understand what prevents mixing to occur between right. material from the outer part of the disk to the inner disk, which seems to have been mitigated, at least right. in our solar system. Right. So the 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 way this is kind of it, it in hindsight, this was obvious to me 15 years ago. We just never did the models. So if you have this is the water vapor distribution, this is water 18. Okay, the, the water self-shielding is happening at the same time CO self-shielding is happening. And for those of who pay attention to this stuff, CO self-shielding was suggested by Lyons and Young and, and Bob Clayton as a potential way to get the, originate these, these oxygen isotopic anomalies. What, ha what is happening is 12C16O will self-shield before 12C18O does. Why? Because the 12C18O you know, has a lower abundance. So its lines, its absorption lines will have lower opacity. Uh, and so they will shield deeper in the disk. Okay. And so what, what's occurring is C18O is self-shielding down here in this disk. So this is height and radius. C18O is self-shielding down here. Water is forming like gangbusters in this region. So water is grabbing all this extra oxygen 18, which can't get into CO yet. It can't get into 12 c 18 o because it hasn't fully shielded yet. And you enrich this layer up here by an awful lot, right? So the ratio should be 500. It's actually 300. It's a factor of two in this layer. And if I could mix this down, then I could perhaps put it in solids. And how can I mix it down? Well, I showed you how you can mix it down through the Krite models, right? Or it's what's so-called the cold finger effect. It's Stevenson and Lunin uh, first uh, promulgated this and Rowan Meyerink and, and, and others. Um, how do I stop? So, so that could give me meteoritic, meteoritic anomalies. How do I separate the, the inner and outer solar system? Well, in the solar system, you, you know, the obvious thing would be Jupiter, right? You form Jupiter. Uh, that results in uh, changes the pressure structure of the disk and material can't migrate in as easily. You don't necessarily have to make Jupiter though. Uh, you just need to have a pressure bump and we observe pressure bumps everywhere now. So I, I'm not too worried about that. So there was a pressure bump. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, said that we said the same thing. The idea seems to be gaining traction at uh, there was an Alma disk type uh, suite of substructures yep. in the early solar system. And Isidoro just published a paper with uh, that lot um, uh, pretty much uh, coming to the same conclusion, which is very heartwarming. So yep. thank, thank you very much, Ted. Sure. Uh, Christiane, you, you had a question or did you again? 
I have another one, if I may. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, thanks for, for, for the overseas people to joining us here today. So it's fun to see how the um, initiative spreads. <laughs> um, I have a question about this self-shielding idea. Isn't that something that actually can be applied to every molecule of a sufficient uh, amount of, uh, of, of sufficient abundance? So why, why is, it, is it so special for, I mean, you, you explained why it is so special for CO and CH2O. So wouldn't we expect um, this to also be, become of importance or of, yeah, of importance for, for other molecules? And if so, which ones would you think these are? Right, right. So, so the, the, the trick is, um, so N2 is another one that has self-shielding, but that's also related to a line process. Um, the, the trick with water is it forms directly from H2 when the temperature gets greater than 400K. So it's O plus H2 goes to OH plus H and OH plus H2 goes to H2O plus H. It's, I, I refer to it as like a water bomb. Uh, anything that can react with H2 will do so immediately, right? Because it's the most abundant molecule around. Uh, and of course, oxygen is the, the third most abundant element in the universe. And so th that's what makes water special. Its abundance can rise so high, so fast, that it's harder for other molecules to reach that level. Uh, so you would need a molecule that forms directly from H2 in this gas uh, and to be of sufficient abundance uh, that it can compete. Um, or its formation rate has to be able, it really its formation rate has to be able to compete uh, and provide enough columns so that you can build up that uh, UV absorption. So I'm not aware of another molecule that would rise to this level. Um, myself, I can't think, I mean, CO2, but I don't think CO2 can form quickly enough. It'll dissociate too quickly. Um, well, I mean, H, H2 is, is yeah, the, H2, the, the one you start with and then maybe CO, and now you say water as well. Uh, yeah. So you have to probably deal with the molecule that is similarly abundant and also has an opacity that is comparable. So we know that H2 is a very strong H UV absorber as is uh, yeah. CO and, and water is as well. Yeah, so I just, I, yeah, I think it's, it's probably special and unique to water. I don't see uh, another question, but, but please feel free to, to raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm just asking maybe one, one question for myself. You, you talked about this, what you call end state chemistry. What we have in our modeling is just what we call the kinetic equilibrium. So you have all the rates, all the process, you take them into account, but instead of solving the whole thing time dependently, you just go for a quick solution of where the concentrations, you know, are such that each species is is um, is produced and destroyed at the same rate, and and I think we are meaning the same thing if I if I am not mistaken. Do we? It depends, right? Because the the traditional models that people run, and we're all guilty of this, is is we. The question is, what do we do with the grains? All right, so when a molecule freezes onto a grain, it comes off at a sublimation temperature that is commensurate with the binding energy that we have assumed, right? And in dark clouds, for example, we see molecules in the gas. So people come up with clever ideas on how to get those molecules off the, off the grain so that we can observe them in the gas. The disks, we don't really need to do that because we have energy and we can just sublimate them, right? Uh, but if the chemistry proceeds, so if I take a CO molecule and I can, I break it apart with a helium plus, uh, I take the C, the C and it, it, it's gonna go somewhere, right? And what it's gonna do is it's gonna make a hydrocarbon and it'll go to the first hydrocarbon that'll freeze out, all right? So that's a typical disk chemistry. It's, 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 it's X-rays and cosmic rays breaking mm -hmm. molecules apart and sticking things as ices somehow. That's a weird equilibrium. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But still, but still, it is. Uh, you can still try to solve for that, and that gives you probably a situation which you just described. Anyway, I I would I would suggest that that we stop here for a break, so everybody can stretch his legs, uh, pick up a coffee, and we uh, resume here in in about ten minutes. And if you have any questions, please uh, make a note that you don't don't forget your question, and then. Uh, come back, please, if you want to. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>